Hello everybody and welcome to my review of volume number one of Yukiya Murasaki's light novel series How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. This one is released by J Novel Club. It's currently only available in ebook format. Uh, Seven Seas is going to be releasing the manga version of this story early on. I think it's, what is it, March or May in 2018. Now this series began publication in Japan in December of 2014. There are currently eight volumes to date, with the most, most recent one having been released in August of 2017. I believe it's still ongoing. The author currently has a bunch of other series that they have written or that are ongoing. One of them called Haken no Koke Altina. It has 13 volumes. So we're not talking about a new author. This is an author that has been writing for some time and has quite a number of series to date under their belt. How Not to Summon a Demon Lord tells the story of Takuma Sakamoto, who is well, he's pretty much a neat who is obsessive about his gameplay of the MMORPG Cross Reverie. One of the features of the game allows advanced players to create their own dungeons that then other players can try and conquer. He's earned a name for himself as being pretty much an unconquerable demon lord in that game that he goes by the name of Diablo. Now, one day he awakens to find himself face to face with a beautiful cat girl and a beautiful female elf. And he realizes that he's not in our world anymore. In fact, he's in a world that is very, very much like the world of Cross Reverie. And it turns out that not only has he been summoned to this world, but he has been summoned in the form of his character, Diablo, and also has all of Diablo's powers. One of which is a automatically activated ability, a passive ability, which is magic reflection. And when these two girls who have summoned him to this world try to cast an enslavement spell on him, it bounces back and enslaves them. So now, as Diablo in this other world, he has to try and find a way to survive, and perhaps even to find a way home. Now, if you've taken a look at, say, a series like Overlord, and you've been like, you know, a series with a guy summoned as his game character to a world similar to the game world, that sounds really cool, but I don't really want it to be dark and, and really, like, heavy and stuff and have a lot of side characters. Like, really, I'd like that setup, but it's got to have, like, harem comedy. It's got to have eshy elements, and it's got to have an elf with big boobs. Well, if you ever thought that, I have found the light novel series for you. How Not to Summon a Demon Lord is really at its heart a mishmash of a bunch of stuff that we have seen in other light novels and, well, just kind of all thrown together into its own little story. I wouldn't say there's a ton of stuff here that's original, um, but at the same time, I wouldn't say that when you take the sum of its parts, it's a horrible light novel. So let's kind of break this down. So of course we have uh, Takumo being brought to this world as Diablo. Well, that does happen in Overlord. And I am going to reference pretty much what we have in English. Obviously, there's lots of stuff in Japanese that has this exact same setup, a character being brought over as their game character. It's not exclusive to Overlord. It's just that Overlord is pretty much the only one we have in English that's exactly like this setup, so I'll be referencing that. We also have in common the fact that in order to try and live in this new world, Takuma tries to basically behave in the way that his Diablo character does. So he's very haughty, he's very conceited, he's pretty much causes problems wherever he goes and whenever he opens his mouth, and in the same way that we see in Overlord, where Eines is trying to take on that sort of more regal and leadership role in order to inspire the loyalty of the members of Nazarek. In the case of Overlord, this whole persona behavior, it kind of is multi-layered. On the one hand, we have it that Eines' behavior is being influenced by the fact that he has become an actual undead lich. 
but it's also the fact that he feels he has to keep this behavior up for fear that these people that pretty much are his only allies will turn against him. In terms of how not to summon a demon lord, we have our character acting this way, and I'll just refer to him as Diablo, because really, once he's there, that's who he is. Um, but we have this character acting this way because of the fact that he is a neat and he really has pretty much zero social skills. And so the only way that he's really interacted with other human beings for quite some time has been through this persona of Diablo online and gaming. Now, it's not really clear in the book to me, like there was a couple times where I thought to myself, either he has zero control and just blurts out stuff out of his mouth, or he has somewhat of the same sort of thing going on that Ainz does in Overlord, where his behavior is somewhat being influenced by the fact that he has been summoned as this character. I'd really like to see the series kind of develop a little bit of that. I, even though, once again, that would be sort of a storyline similar to what we're seeing in Overlord, at least it's a little deeper and a little bit more interesting and can create a little bit more of this sort of internal character conflict. Because the fact is, is that Diablo is OP as OP. Like, OP. And in this way, it at least, this is one of the stronger points I would say of the book, is that at least it acknowledges the fact that he is, and he comes with a plausible reason why that is. And I won't spoil it because it's probably one of the more intelligent moments in the book where he kind of comes up with this actual theory and it's a pretty sound one as to why he is so powerful whereas these other characters who have been living in this world are not. The other thing that I think would be sort of a strength of this book is that at least the two female characters we have Rem who is the cat girl and we have Shara who is the elf. Each of them has a a decent reason for wanting to summon a incredibly powerful individual to aid them in this world. I'd say that Rem's reasoning is a lot bigger and is probably going to have a much longer impact to the storyline. Uh, but I mean, Shara's nonetheless, it it's still somewhat justifiable and at least it gives these characters a background and it gives them a little bit of a fleshing out and even in terms of their character the fact that rem is a much more serious much more analytical much more professional type character her background and the reason that she has summoned diablo it all ties together the same thing with shara who we have who is much more of a, well, she's kind of the big busted bubblehead character. And I won't say that like, it's just that she's clueless, but well, she definitely has a background that has kind of helped to mold her into this. And in this way, I would say again, like even though these characters are not unique, um, in fact, immediately I thought of, in terms of Rem, I thought of Yue in Ari Ferretta, and for Shara, I thought of Shea, their names are even, well, Rem isn't like UA, but Shara, Shea, very close. And again, we have that same thing. We have sort of the more lolly body type who is serious and powerful and analytical. And then we have the big boobed bubblehead. <laughs> Although I would argue that Shea is a lot more useful in her first outing than Shara is in this book, but that's all beside the point. The other thing about this book that you're probably going to be wondering about is, as I said, there was going to, there's Eshi elements. Well, you know what? It's really, it's really kind of an unfortunate thing. <laughs> um, the thing is, is that Especially given, especially given our atmosphere that we are going through right now, okay? We, we are learning that powerful men do horrible things and treat women in horrible ways and men in horrible ways. It is, it is a problem in our society that we have long turned a, blonde, a blind eye to or that has been hidden by those who are pow powerful from us. So when you're reading a light novel and you have a character, Diablo, who wants information and obtains it by basically sexually assaulting one of the characters, it's a problem. And even though it's played a little bit off for the kind of laughs and that he does it, I mean, like he rubs her ears, it's the cat girl. And, and 
even though he does it and, and like, even though it, like obviously rubbing someone's ears in our society is not necessarily sexual. I mean, I guess it could be obviously, but, um, but even though the, we wouldn't na na naturally just kind of jump to, oh, that's sexual assault. It is very clear what kind of effect he is having on her. And it's played off in the whole that, well, he's really inexperienced and with people in general, let alone like, you know, having anything to do with a girl. So he doesn't even really get what it is that he's doing. But it's, it's a little uncomfortable, I would think. Uh, well, I mean, it was for me as a reader. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, you can't go with a girl with massive breasts without the main character accidentally getting a handful of them. It happens in light novels all the time. We have talked a little bit about how it's problematic and we have talked a bit about how it's maybe a trope that we really should just get over because it's just way, way, way overplayed and really doesn't serve much of a purpose anymore. But in this particular case, instead of him realizing what's happening and going, oh my God, nah, he kind of keeps at it until he gets totally caught. She's asleep at the time, the first time. The second time... Well, at least there's some kind of consent the second time. Yeah, oh, it's so murky. Um, and like I said, like, just given, given what is being brought to light in an increasingly large number of cases, it just feels a little... And trying to just play it off as like, it's sexual hijinks, he doesn't really know, he's just, it's just because he's super inexperienced and... You know, the first time you touched a girl's boobies, you didn't want to stop either. And I mean, that may be true or not, but I mean, she was awake and she said yes, which that didn't happen in this book. So, yeah. I mean, you know what? Like, I, like the thing is, is that you're going to land on sort of three spots on this. First of all, either you're going to be passionately against it because of how you feel about that sort of thing. You're either going to be, you know enticed by it, which I think is the exact reason that the author has it here, or you're going to be apathetic for it by it because of it, because you're going to be like, well, we've seen this kind of crap in light novels, manga, and anime so much that it doesn't even make an impression on me anymore. So, I mean, where you land on this, I'm not going to judge you, but you should know that it's in the book and that it happens. Um, the one thing that I will say I was glad about, though, is this whole mechanic of the slave collars. I was really afraid of where that was going to go, and I'm not going to say that it never goes there in later volumes, but I can at least say that in this first volume, it isn't played that he takes advantage of the girls in any way using those collars. Um, in fact, he only finds out that how they work by accident, and pretty much they are just used as a mechanic to cause further misunderstandings and conflict with other characters who misunderstand what has happened, um, as opposed to, again, like him mistreating the girls or using them or manipulating them. So I was at least glad to see that because I, I really, you know, when the front picture is a elf girl with really big boobs and a chain collar around her neck, you're, you're just a little... You're not too sure what you're going to get into. I mean, let's face it, light novels, that, that could go a whole bunch of different ways. Like some of them, some of them stuff you don't want to really talk about on camera on YouTube because they will demonetize you like that. In any case, then we have like, what's going on with the story though? Okay, big deal. He feels up an elf. He, you know, fondles the ears of a cat girl. It's rifting on a bunch of other light novels. Is there even a good story to this whole thing? Well, it's pretty much average, you know? It, it really is just a very much introductory book, giving you an idea of how the world works, giving you a little bit about politics and how the world is run. And it's got some action sequences. There's like a big battle towards the end. We get to actually see Diablo flex a little bit of his muscle to see just, you know, what his powers are capable of. Um, but there's not like a huge driving plot. It really is just that first introductory book where our character gets acquainted with the world and just kind of meets a bunch of other side characters that will probably be more important down the road. And we have a setup for what is probably most definitely like kind of the first arc um, in terms of what's going to happen in sec the second book. Like this one ends with a really obvious setup for what's going to happen in book two. 
So, as I said, it's it's not a horrible book if you know what you're going in for. If you're looking for that more dark, mature, very lived-in and gritty kind of fantasy world, Overlord is a lot better bet than this one. But if you kind of like that setup, and like I said, you're in it more for like the harem comedy and hijinks and stuff, then this one's not horrible. It has a couple of those questionable moments, which some of you, like I said, you'll you'll kind of land in three different spots depending on your approach to the whole thing. And, as, you know, the characters, Diablo is, well, I think a lot more could be done with his character. And I mean, as I said that earlier, right? If, if they get into this whole idea of almost a split personality, there's the evil Diablo and then there is, you know, this poor Japanese kid who thinks that he's just trying to do what he can to get along with people because he sucks at it. That could be interesting. And at least in the case of like Rem and Shara, like I said, they have at least some decent motivations for why they're doing what they're doing, why they're even kind of tolerating some of the things that are happening to them. So overall, not a bad light novel. I don't think there's a ton here that's super original that has me excited or thinking that it's doing anything really all that different with the isekai genre or even like you know, playing up the harem thing a different way or what have you. So if you're looking for something that's kind of more of the same, I think this is definitely not a bad book. But if you are like me and you're reading through a gazillion light novels and you're trying to decide which ones are really worth your time because they're truly unique and different, I think this one falls short of that mark. So those are my thoughts on volume number one of How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. My next review is going to be on volume number five of ReZero. Uh, certainly one of the isekais that I think has had a excellent storyline and has had quite a few unique elements to it and definitely some very interesting and engaging characters. So that will be my next review. So if you love light novels and you're brand new to the channel, you should consider subscribing. I do two to three reviews every single week as well as a weekly countdown of the top 10 best-selling light novels in Japan. Thank you so much for joining me in this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, bye-bye for now.